The chair recognizes the sergeant at arms. The sergeant at arms announces the presence in the chamber of General Mark A. Milley, the Chief of Staff of the United States Army, Lieutenant General Timothy J. Kadavi, the Director of the Army National Guard, Major General Glenn H. Curtis, the Adjutant General of Louisiana and the President of the Adjutant's General Association, Major General Linda Singh, the Adjutant General of Maryland. Where the Sergeant at Arms escorted our distinguished guest and his party to the platform. He's in charge. I'm not wearing stars anymore, but I recognize those four. You know, General Milley was with us here last year and gave a speech that altered the course of relations with the Army for us. Since then, he's backed up those words with actions, and I think our Army is stronger for it today. General Milley, it's great to have you back again this year. We know we have a lot of people waiting here to see what you have to say this year, and perhaps they have a few questions in mind for you if you're willing to take them at that time. Sir, the podium is yours. Oh. Can I tweet about you? Hmm? Can I tweet that you're here? Sure. Why don't you all like, sit down? Here, let me do this. Let me bang this thing here. Huh? No, yeah, there you go, boom. Okay, hey, I'm really uh, humbled uh, to be back here for a second year in a row. Uh, but what really amazed me is uh, that y'all invited me back. So uh, thanks, thanks, and um, it's really uh, quite an entrance. Uh, I forgot about that entrance last year, and uh, that can kind of go to your head sometimes, and you can start thinking like like you're someone. Uh, but uh, but I'm really I really appreciate that. That's pretty cool, you know, walking down there and you know, all that stuff. So, uh, and I really like Tim Cadavy uh, too. <laughs> so, good job, Deb. Well done. In ROTC back in the day, we used to call him Cadaver, General Cadaver. But uh, but that's good. So we'll just we'll just go with Tim. It's easier to remember. Hey, you just had a great uh, a great discussion there with. Uh, Wonderful Secretary of the Air Force, uh, Deb James. Uh, she's uh, uh, fantastic as a leader in the Department of Defense. We're all blessed to have her. So I don't know if she's still in the room, but uh, I just want to thank her and give her a shout out uh, for what she does. And I, and I want to thank a few uh, other folks. I don't know if Frank Grass is somewhere in here, I was told. I don't know if he is or not. There he is. Frank's. Uh, Frank, of course, uh, uh, just uh, recently retired, uh, did his retirement ceremony out in the great state of Missouri. Is Missouri floating around here? 
Were you guys way in the back of the room with the low percentage numbers or something like that? I didn't know what those percentages were. I had to ask when I came in, and now I know. So it's like a grade sheet. You guys are very public about things. It's a grading sheet. Oh my God! But thanks, uh, thanks Frank for for uh, being here, and thanks for your leadership. Uh, you were great. Uh, you continue to be great. And I know you're going to continue to uh, serve your nation. Of course, he was uh, replaced by an equally great officer with Joe Langell. And uh, Joe's uh, where is Joe? You're somewhere around here. There you are. Joe, thanks for what you're about to do and what you've been doing and really what you've been doing all your life. And as many of you know, he's got a family of uh, service, uh, family history, a great service with his father being a, a EPW in North Vietnam during the war. Uh, and then the rest of his family, almost everyone in that family has, has served in one capacity or another. Uh, and, and I'm glad to see that you're still serving in the United States Army Air Corps. So that's good. <laughs> And I want to uh, particularly thank Gus and, and uh, Gus uh, Hargett and, and uh, Glenn Curtis as well, uh, because both of them have provided such great leadership, uh, not only to the Guard, but to the Army uh, and to the whole Army and really to the entire military in so many ways. And I know we have a lot of airmen in, uh, in here and Air Force uh, folks in here, uh, but those two have provided tremendous leadership. Uh, in Glenn's case, leading the tags, uh, tag himself, but also leading the tags. And then, uh, and also uh, Gus for just doing what he's been doing uh, for so long with this organization. Uh, so thanks, Gus, uh, for what you're doing. And I want to acknowledge uh, the former chiefs of the National Guard as a group. Uh, and, and I want to single out uh, General Temple, uh, who's kind of the uh, professor emeritus around here. Uh, he's, uh, thanks, General Temple, for being here. You may or may not know it, but uh, he's a young man of 87. He's going strong, uh, tough as nails, and he was a young buck sergeant uh, in the Korean War. Uh, and that was a war that many, many people don't read enough about. Uh, it was a terrible war. It was a hard war. It was a brutal war. It was a vicious war. And there's so many lessons about readiness and preparedness that come from the Korean War. And that war was fought uh, by another greatest generation uh, led today by General Temple here. So thank you, sir, for being here. And there's a great lineup of speakers. Uh, you're real privileged to have uh, some wonderful folks uh, coming and talking to you. And, and I feel particularly humbled uh, to be here as the keynote speaker is what I guess I was advertised as. I don't quite feel I warrant to be the keynote speaker, given a few of the other speakers that I heard a coming on Monday. So, but I am labeled the keynote speaker. So I'll give it a shot, I guess. But, but thanks. Thanks for having me and I appreciate it. And I do have a couple of messages uh, for you that I'll, I'll talk to in a few minutes and then we'll do some uh, Q&A and I hope you'll uh, ask me some questions and if I don't have the answers, uh, I'll tell you that and, and we'll try to get you the answers. But uh, one thing I think is important and you all know this, but I understand uh, that we're being tweeted and live streamed. So many people may not know it, uh, but our National Guard, uh, the United States National Guard, traces our lineage uh, back to a great state, my state, uh, the state of Massachusetts. Now, where are you at, Massachusetts? Well, at, least you, at least you're not as far back as Rhode Island on that percentage thing. <laughs> so that's good. So back in, back in 1636, uh, is when the uh, initial militias were formed and they were chartered uh, to defend and protect all the various colonies uh, in, uh, in the, uh, back in the day. And they were so critical uh, and they provided the backbone of the Revolutionary War. And it was they at Lexington Green, 10 minutes from my house, who fired the first shots of liberty heard around the world. And it was they who responded to the call, responded to the colors, who gathered on the march back from Concord Bridge to Boston. And it was those militias, it was you, it was your predecessors. And I can't tell you how proud I am to be from the state that started the United States National Guard.
And this, and this association uh, is also critical. Uh, it didn't form quite in 1636, and Gus has not been its leader the entire time. <laughs> but it was formed in 1878, and it was formed to advance the interests of the National Guard, and, and which wasn't even called the National Guard at that point in time. Uh, but it was formed to advance the interests of the National Guard, national security writ large. And they have done, over the years, over so many years, have done such a great job. So I want to thank you, Gus, uh, and all of your predecessors uh, for providing uh, a voice uh, to the Guardsmen, both Army and Air, uh, throughout our history, uh, and providing a voice for national security throughout our history. So thanks, Gus, to you and the entire association. I want to... I want to mention, uh, and I know there are some in the crowd tonight, uh, many, many more that are not, uh, but uh, I want to say uh, thanks, uh, not only to all of you in uniform but, uh, and all the veterans, but to the wounded warriors and to the families uh, that are not only here today but are uh, out and about in our country and overseas. And it's particularly poignant, I think, on this 15th anniversary of 9-1-1 when we were viciously attacked from a bolt out of the blue by a terrorist organization that intended to destroy the United States of America. All our lives and all our destinies were forever changed in those moments. And we have been at war for 15 consecutive years. And so many soldiers, airmen, sailors, and Marines, so many guardsmen, have given their lives or their limbs. And all of you have made sacrifices in defense of that freedom. And I want to thank all of you for what you've done in the last decade and a half of war. A year ago, I stood before you, and I recounted the story of our guard. And I emphasized that we were one army. Just as water can exist in three states, a solid, a liquid, and a gas. We are one army. We were one army a year ago, and we're one army today, and we're going to remain one army forever. And I said, and I meant it then, I mean it now, and I'm going to mean it tomorrow that we're not an army of 10 divisions. We're an army of 18 divisions. We're not an army of 32 BCTs. We're an army of 60 brigade combat teams. We are one army forever and forever indivisible. And readiness for that army will remain our number one priority. We have no other choice. General Temple fought in a war in which the forces that initially deployed were not ready. And we paid the butcher's bill in blood for that unreadiness. We can never, ever, ever allow ourselves to do that again. And right now, it's fair to ask, readiness for what? Well, first of all, we're still engaged in active operations around the world against various terrorist organizations. And you're familiar with them, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and so on. That mission, that task, is likely to remain for quite some time. Those people, those enemies, those members of that terrorist group still intend, as they did on 9-1-1, to destroy your freedoms, to kill you, to kill your families. They still intend to destroy the United States of America, Western Europe, our allies, our partners and to threaten our vital national interest. That is and will remain a key task for the total army. But there are additional challenges that the Secretary of Defense has laid out for us, including China, Russia, North Korea, Iran. In addition, we have to defend the homeland. That's a tall order. It's a tall order to deal with those challenges. It's a tall order to defend the United States of America. Freedom is not free. It takes sacrifice, it takes lives, and most of all, it takes a trained 
and ready United States military. And you are key to that effort. We totally, all of us, every one of us in uniform, regardless of the color of our uniform, we must remain prepared. We can never break faith with the American people. We owe that to them. We signed up for it. We took an oath to it, and we will not fail. As readiness is our number one priority, I can tell you that over the last year, we've taken very concrete steps to improve the readiness of the total Army. As re with regard to the National Guard in particular, in 2016, we had two Guard Brigade combat teams go to decisive action rotations and, and two divisions headquarters execute their warfighters. And we're probably going to do the same in this year. But in 2018, we went ahead and put into the budget that we're going to double that to four. So we'll have four National Guard, Army National Guard, Brigade Combat Teams go to decisive action training, combat training centers, two at the National Training Center and two at JRTC. And that's a 100% increase in the training readiness of the combat formations within the National Guard. In addition to that, we took a page, in addition to that, we took a page out of the uh, former colony of Massachusetts called New Hampshire, their National Guard. Sorry, that was my inside voice. I didn't mean that. The great granite state. So live free or die, baby. So what's your percentage? Okay, so, but well, we took a page, the Army took a page out of the Air Force. Uh, and as you know, the Air Force has had associated units for quite some time. So uh, we decided essentially to do uh, a very similar thing. Uh, and our current associated unit pilot program is currently gaining momentum. Uh, right now, we've got 14 different associated units across all the components. Uh, and that's allowing us to leverage, better leverage, uh, the capabilities of the Guard and the regular Army integrated. It's not going as far as I want yet. So in the next few years, uh, I'm aiming towards full integration of the National Guard and the regular Army, where units will actually be part of the other unit. So active to Guard and Guard to active. And I know there's some hurdles there uh, that I've got to work through, uh, some legal issues and uh, some matters of law, and Title 32, Title 10, all that. So we'll do that. Uh, but the point is integration in order to improve readiness. Uh, because we are one army and the army is a million folks. 980,000 is where we're heading. So it's about a million. That's a big army. It's a capable army. It's a strong army. But it's only strong, it's only capable if we are together and fully integrated. So we're going to move uh, in that direction. I mentioned last year also that we were going to go ahead and increase the training days. And as, uh, as Clausewitz said, you know, everything in war is difficult. Well, that's really difficult too. So increasing training days has proven uh, to come off my lips pretty easy, but it ran into whole kinds of problems. So I'm going to do it, though. We're not done. So, and we're going to do it because we have to do it. Because those challenges I meant up front, the possibility of armed conflict is real, and the time available to mobilize and deploy may not, it might, but it might not uh, be available in the next conflict. So I feel, as the Chief of Staff of the Army, I have an obligation to increase the readiness of the National Guard Brigade combat teams to a point where we can reduce the amount of post-mobilization time required in order to generate combat power in the fight. Uh, Tim Cadavy, or Tim Cadaver, <laughs> sorry, is, uh, has worked hard uh, for quite some time now uh, to come up with options that are realistic, affordable, achievable, et cetera, uh, and uh, that folks in the Guard can live with it in the sense of your civilian employment. Uh, so we're going to move out on that. And I think that uh, we've put in the palm into the budget uh, requests uh, for additional monies to increase the amount of training days. Uh, it's a big deal. It's important. It is a challenge. Uh, but I do think that we're going to be able to get there. Uh, and when we get there, that'll make us a better Army overall, as we'll have better preparation. Uh, so the implementation of that is yet to come. We hope to implement it in 2018. Our Guard, as you know, 
uh, has provided an incredible amount of support to our state governors, the president, uh, combatant commanders over the full uh, range of operations. Uh, and I want to take a moment uh, just to review a little bit, uh, not so much for you in the room, because you in the room are fully aware of it, uh, but for those who are not in the room, uh, what uh, my guard, my Army guard, does uh, on a day-to-day -day basis uh, throughout the world. Uh, first of all, you're key, uh, not only in current operations at the tactical and operational level, uh, but you provide the operational and strategic depth to the nation. Uh, you are, in fact, uh, what makes the difference uh, between the United States of America's military and other militaries around the world because of the depth, the skill, the talent uh, that is in your ranks. Since 9-1-1, since 15 years ago, the National Guard has deployed over 553,000, half a million soldiers uh, performing every type of Army mission around the world. And right now, today, as I stand here at this podium, there are 10,000 Guardsmen mobilized worldwide in a variety of named operations. Our rotational demand for Army National Guard forces has increased and continues to increase. And this year, we will see eight or four of the eight National Guard divisions uh, deployed in one capacity or another. The Great Texas Division, 36 ID, where you at? Whoa, you guys are way back there. <laughs> Dude, I have a Texas license, so you got you to gotta crank it up and get up front here for next year. So, but the 36th Division, 36th ID, the Arrowhead Division, right now uh, is deployed. Maybe that's why their percentage is low, because they're deployed. So, but right now they're deployed uh, in Operation Resolute Support uh, in Afghanistan. That's the first time a Guard unit's commanded an AOR uh, in Afghanistan. The 40th ID from California, which is General Temple's old division. Where's, where's California? Uh, that's not bad. I don't know. Yeah, a little louder. But, uh, right now, right now, of course, they're leading our multinational uh, training mission uh, in, uh, in the Ukraine. And that's a really critical mission in a really critical part of the world right now. How about Virginia? Where you at? Blue and gray. Who the heck's up front? <laughs> it's like everybody's in the back. Gosh, you got to get out there and, you know, you got to do your salesmanship a little bit more. All right, so... So we got the great uh, 29th Division, and uh, right now they're in training, uh, getting ready to head to Jordan and uh, Kuwait. And of course, uh, we've got the 38th. Where's Indiana? Mississippi, where you at? You hear that, Indiana? Could you hear that back there? But not to be outdone by Mississippi, Indiana is right now deployed in, in, in support of NORTHCOM, uh, and they provide our critical uh, chemical and biological, radiological uh, defense units. And we have brigade combat teams right now regionally deployed in SOUTHCOM, UCOM, AFRICOM, uh, and in support of every combatant commander, uh, in addition to CTC rotations back here uh, from the uh, 27th uh, Brigade out of New York. So where's, uh, where's New York? New York didn't come? Oh man, you're back, you're back there with Rhode Island, all right. So, and in addition, uh, we've got the 28th Division, the Keystone Cape. Where are you at? What? How about Mississippi again? At least Mississippi's got some life there, Pennsylvania. But right now, the, the great 28th, the Bloody Bucket Division of World War II is back in Germany no less, in Grafenwehr, and uh, they're getting ready to go to uh, Kosovo and assume the duties of K4. So 2,100 Army National Guard soldiers from 26 states right now are participating in 24 overseas training activities <clears throat> within PACOM in support of Admiral Harris. And that's a critical area as well. If you listened to the challenges that I said up front, Two of those challenges, China and North Korea, are in Admiral Harris's AOR. And I'm sure you couldn't have missed the news the other day of what North Korea did. So we sent the 2nd Brigade Combat Team from the mighty 34th Division from Iowa to participate. 
I don't know, is Iowa louder than Mississippi? Mississippi. No. Iowa. No. I think the vote goes to Iowa. What do you think? No. Unless Mississippi can come back. No. All right. But right now, what they're doing, other than yelling, is participating in a great exercise called Pacific Pathways out in Alaska. And we sent 1,600 Army National Guard soldiers from eight states and 10 units to participate in Exercise Anaconda, which I had the privilege of observing over in Poland. This is the largest exercise ever conducted in U.S. Army Europe area of operations since the end of the Cold War, with over 31,000 service members from 24 different nations, with the sole purpose to demonstrate resolve, assure our allies, and deter any further aggression from Russia. We sent a multi-armed or combined arms uh, multi-role bridge company from the 116th Cav out of Idaho. Is Idaho floating around? Ooh, got to work on you. So Montana, Montana, Oregon. That was good. And I don't know if you even know it, but one of your bridge companies right now is hanging out in Romania, uh, working on exercise Sabre Guardian 16. And then, of course, we have Task Force Steel with 800 National Guardsmen from Missouri. Cool. Right here. I almost blew my eardrum out up here. <laughs> but also Nebraska. Yeah. Pennsylvania. South Carolina, Mississippi, no, you didn't, Mississippi's actually not on that deployment, but, but South Carolina was. So right now they're operating in support of uh, Admiral Harris as well. And then we have state partnership programs uh, that are really important strategically. Uh, and right now we have 73 of those. And the plan this year is to expand those to 76 uh, in support of all of our uh, combatant commanders. Uh, we also uh, have, from our guard, contributed over half a million man days uh, in support of domestic operations, uh, ranging from search and rescue and explosive ordnance disposal EOD responses uh, throughout the country, and of course natural disaster responses under Title 32 and state active duty uh, requirements. Guard soldiers have helped secure the Pope. <clears throat> They've helped secure his uh, visits to Washington, D.C., and New York, and Philadelphia. And most recently, uh, he did a great job in securing both the Democratic and Republican National Conventions being completely uh, nonpartisan, and you secured both, and there was no violence at either. So that's great. And you guys did a great job uh, securing uh, our most basic right, the First Amendment right, uh, as an American people. So uh, bottom line is the National Guard in every corner of the globe, uh, no matter where you've served, no matter whether you've been in Afghanistan or heading to Jordan or Kuwait, or whether you're in Europe or South America, Africa or Asia, uh, whether you're in the United States or not, uh, the National Guard has done a tremendous job. And who can forget domestically the imagery from last year and the wildfires uh, in the West, uh, one of the worst fire seasons uh, in decades, or the historic flooding in Columbia, South Carolina uh, from, from a hurricane, or the most recent unbelievable flooding in Louisiana, the 500-year flood. Without the National Guard, our nation's ability to protect not only overseas interests, but to respond to natural disasters here at home and protect the American people, our ability to do that would not exist without the American National Guard. And those are ones that you see. There are some things that you don't see in the Guard, like National Guard soldiers right now, today, on watch around the country, executing air and missile defense missions, an incredibly important task that is very, very rarely seen by anyone. Providing key assets to secure our borders, our southern borders, and supporting, as I mentioned earlier, 
uh, with the Seaburn mission, the Chemical Biological Protection Mission. Those are missions uh, that very few people pay attention to or ever see, but are so fundamentally important uh, to the life and the livelihood of the American people. The bottom line is, my National Guard, my Army National Guard, your Army National Guard is great. It's an incredible organization, and I am so very proud to be the Chief of Staff of America's National Guard. But as we look to the future, the only thing that ever matters for us in uniform is whether you win or not. And winning is not done only when you cross the line of departure. Winning is done every single day. And it's done in everything what you do at home station training. It's done at the combat training centers. But it's also done in little things, competitions. For example, the last year, Army National Guard soldiers and teams from California, Colorado, Pennsylvania, Illinois, and North Carolina all distinguished themselves by winning, participating, in, and then winning an incredibly difficult competition that I personally witnessed, the best ranger competition. They won the Sullivan Cup. The National Guard won the U.S. Army Small Arms Competition. And on and on it goes. The level of competition, the spirit of winning, is also present every single day in the National Guard. Another key component that the National Guard brings to the total army and really brings to the nation is you're the face of our army to the American people. America's army is and always has been the people's army. We come from the people and we reflect the society at large. We are a people's army and it's the National Guard more than any other component of our army that is the face of our army to the American people. Our active component forces <laughs> our active component force, our regular army, we tend to be geographically concentrated at major forts. So the folks in the surrounding communities see us frequently and now and again they'll see us going through an airport. But that only accounts for a small sliver of America. You are the Main Street Army. You are the army that people throughout our entire country, in all of our states, in all of our cities, in all of our communities, they see you, you work with them, you go to the, your civilian jobs, you do the weekend duty, you do, the, you do all the mobilization stuff, but you are representing the entire United States military every single day that you live in your local community. And that's another important, unseen, and very little talked about aspect of the National Guard. And there are other things that you do in your communities uh, that very few people will see, <clears throat> but many of you do very heroic actions, like Specialist Lauren Kopetsky of the Iowa National Guard, who provided immediate, who provided immediate first aid to a multiple gunshot wound victim and saved his life. Or Master Sergeant Christopher Bushway from the Vermont National Guard, who saved the life of a truck driver trapped in a burning and crushed uh, vehicle. He also recently saved another guy from a heart attack by administering first aid. So if you're having a problem, go, go find Master Sergeant Bushway. <laughs> or Sergeant Jameson Barcher of South Dakota Army National Guard, who while other cars Good, a little louder. You're getting louder than Mississippi, South Dakota. Let's hear that again. You guys know Barcher? You know him? Uh, of course you do. Because what he did was he broke into a burning vehicle with a fire extinguisher and saved the lives of three people, including a little infant girl. And Master Sergeant Robert Allender of the California Net Guard what he did was, while forward deployed in Afghanistan, he saved the life of six people injured in a helicopter crash during Operation Resolute Support. And then there's Sergeant First Class Caleb Brewer of 19th Special Forces Group, who lost both his legs while deployed to Afghanistan to an IED in December of last year. Caleb is an amazing soldier. 
He kept calm, and he actually cracked jokes while he was being medevaced. With the support of his family and his Special Forces teammates and the recovery staff and all the medical personnel, he continues his courageous recovery today, and he sets a great example for what it means to be Army strong, no matter what component you come from. As we acknowledge and we cite individual acts of heroism or, or the tremendous levels of effort that various State Guard units have done overseas or at home, but we need to also acknowledge that we're heading into a world that's changing, a world that's changing in unpredictable ways. And we're going to have to figure that out. We're going to have to deal with it. I believe the nature of war is not going to change. I believe that that is fundamental and immutable. I believe that it, war is an extension of politics. I believe there's friction and chance, chaos involved in the act of war. And I believe it's essentially an act of imposing your will upon the enemy through the use of organized violence. That's the nature of war. But the character of war is changing, and it's changing fast, and it's changing in a lot of ways that are so very fundamental. I believe we are on the cusp of such a fundamental change in the character of ground warfare that it will be the equivalent of going from the horse to the tank, or to go from the smoothbore musket to the rifled musket. Technology, for example, is about to have a profound impact on that character of war, and ground war in particular. We already see it happening in the maritime domain. We see it happening in the air and space domain. And there's no doubt that within a very short amount of time, it's going to have significant and fundamental change in the ground domain. We see the proliferation of unmanned aerial vehicles, precision-guided munitions, cyber, robotics, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, laser weapons, rail guns, hypervelocity weapons, just to name a few. All of these are going to fundamentally change what we look like, how we fight, what our doctrine is, what organizations we fight with. All of that is going to change. But what won't change is the very, very nature of war. And what won't change is that war is a human activity. And it is won or lost on the shoulders, on the backs of soldiers and sailors and airmen and Marines. So what won't change is the fundamental importance of the American soldier. And what won't change is the fundamental importance of the American National Guard. And while we move into that future, we also have to continue not only at the readiness of our soldiers, but we have to look after our families. And I recognize that that's particularly difficult for the National Guard, <clears throat> for uh, the Army family programs as it's associated with the National Guard. And I intend and I commit to you uh, that I'm digging into that, and I'm going to try to improve that in the coming year. And I know that. And I know that with, with me, along, alongside me in that effort over the coming year, uh, we'll not only be Nagas, but uh, we'll have uh, also the Guard Bureau and Tim, uh, but I'll have Joe Langell and, and I'll have all the tags and, and, the, and the governors uh, working hard on that as well. So I appreciate the full teamwork on that. So let me just conclude with a couple of notes. Uh, one is our adversaries and our allies alike must know that when the United States Army is coming, we're coming as a total army, regardless of the mission. And it absolutely doesn't matter what patch is on our left shoulder. What matters is the tape above our left breast that says United States Army. We have an army today that is capable, more lethal, better trained, better led, better equipped 
than any enemy on the face of the earth. Our challenge is to make sure that army stays ready. And then our other challenge is to adapt that army into the future. No matter where we go, and we go where we're needed, no matter where we go, no matter who we fight, the United States Army is dedicated and committed to win. That is our contract with America. That's our contract of the People's Army to the American people. Their national security lies on your shoulder, and we cannot fail them. Thank you so much for having me here tonight, and I appreciate everything that you do every day, no matter whether it's here in the United States or overseas. Thanks so much, and we have a great guard. Sure. Okay, so I'm told that we have uh, about 20 minutes or so uh, for Q&A, and I'm willing to field whatever you want to talk about. You want to talk about the Red Sox, Free Brady, you know, you name it, I'll talk about it. How does this work? Is there somebody out there who's going to call on them? Or? Take your questions through the center microphones again. Wow. Nobody has any questions? You're dumbfounded. You're just shocked I'm even here. Two years in a row, I set a record. Okay. So, Sir, I'll go. Brigadier General Tom Spencer, State of New Hampshire. New Hampshire. Who? I, where you at? I can't see you, General. There you are. All right, I got you. I'm like a good Air Force pilot. I can see you now. <laughs> Sir, one of your questions reference uh, BCT rotations and increasing that by 100% and that's greatly appreciated. The one comment I would ask for consideration is also to look at the functional brigades, MEBS, aviation field, artillery, and having those collective training events as well. We don't get them together enough in the Guard in a collective environment with our active component to also do that training. And that's a training necessity so that we can mass and do deep ops. Just ask that consideration. Okay, I'll do that. And uh, can you do me a homework assignment? Yes, sir. Can you send me an email? Roger. BFR direct to me. I'm the only Millie in the book. I'm on Global, and I'm easy to find. And you don't have to send it through anybody. Uh, no, no chain of command, just flat, boom, straight to me. I won't use your name, but give me the particulars on that, uh, and I will look into it. Yes, sir. We have a great training resource in the Guard now through XCTCs to do that, and it has been done, and we can do it again. And Absolutely. I'll, I'll look into it, and, uh, and I know Tim took that note as well, even though I didn't see the pen out, but my pen's out. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Hey, Glenn, Glenn, can you give Tim a pen? <laughs> Tim, do you need a piece of paper? <laughs> Let me help you out, son. There you go. Here, I have a blank card. Here. Just got to, just helping him out, you know. Joined at the hip, one army, baby. All right, so. All right, good question. Thanks for that. Good evening, sir. Lieutenant Colonel Deidre Smith from the Mississippi National Guard, Director of Outreach Services. Mississippi. What? You gotta love Mississippi. All right. Yes, sir. We are extremely concerned about our readiness and resiliency with our families and our child and youth program services. And we are under the we are understanding that on the 13th of September this Tuesday, there is a huge opportunity to either promote our child and youth programs and extend them forward, or an opportunity that it might be canceled completely across the nation. And I just wanted to ask you, what is your considerations about continuing to allow that program to thrive so that we're investing in the future of our children, for our military children? Well, I want anything to thrive that's going to be for our children. I'm, I am, I, I hate to sound like the Vitrola dog sort of thing right now, but I'm not aware of whatever uh, this thing on 13. Can you tell me a little bit more about 13 September Tuesday? And what, it, what do you mean it's about to expire or whatever's going to happen? Yes, sir. We had a conference call on the 8th with Miss um, Nadine Moore from NGB in regards to the child and youth programs. 
and it is my understanding it's my understanding that the program funding was possibly going to be used for a bill payer for something else. So the big decision is going to be coming on the 13th, whether or not we will be able to keep those programs or will they be cut completely? I think Tim Cadavy is about to stand up here. <laughs> Are you tracking this, Ranger? He is tracking this. Come, Standing. help. One Army. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I, th I think the event on the 13th is a, a feedback to look at uh, where the right place is uh, to put funding. And there haven't been any decisions made. Right now, the, the telecon was to, to get an idea of what is being accomplished and see if there's a better way to do it and make sure we put dollars in the right places. We are going to continue to ensure that we provide programs to families and, and children. We just want to make sure we're doing it right and we're effective and we have proper oversight, and we're taking care of using correctly the, the dollars that the government gives us. Thanks. Yes, sir. Thank you. Doesn't it work so much better when you work together? <laughs> All right. Next question. Anybody else? How about Massachusetts? Any questions from Massachusetts? Yes, sir. Go ahead. You're at the microphone. You from Massachusetts? No, sir. Oregon. But you want to be, right? I'm an Oregon boy, sir. Oregon. Yes, sir. Uh, or Major Lule, uh, Oregon National Guard. A few years ago, Oregon turned in our C-23s, and uh, with the understanding we're going to be getting the C-27s, uh, that's clearly fallen through, and it seems to be um, kind of a vacuum. Is there a plan to fill that, or? I don't know. Uh, I'll find out, unless Tim <laughs> knows the answer. I don't know the answer to your question, but Tim, do you know the answer to that question? If you don't, that's fine. I know the first part of it. He knows, he all, he knows half of an answer. <laughs> Go ahead. So, so the C-23s, the Sherpas, uh, those went out of the inventory. Uh, the C-27 was an Army airplane. They got turned over to the United States Air Force, and they killed it. you got to ask the Air Force uh, what, what happened to the C-27. Uh, but, but, but currently, uh, the United States Army is, going, is, is researching the future of the utility aircraft, the next fixed wing. Uh, there aren't any decisions made on that. It's just basically in the development of the requirement right now, sir. I'll figure it out for you. What, give me a number. My, How do I get a hold of you? What's your I, name? I can, I can email you if you want, sir. S send me an email. All right, will do, sir. I'm at the same email I said to the other guy from New Hampshire. I'll get you an answer. We'll get you a full answer on that. I didn't even know what a C-23 was until you said it, so. And now I understand the Air Force has them, so I'll try to get them back. All right, so next question. Yes, ma'am. Hey, or sir. Ma'am, sir. Ma'am. Ma ma there you are. Who is sir? Um, Colonel Angie Stoll, Chief of Staff of the Colorado Army National Guard. Uh, we are fortunate to have the uh, first of the 157th Infantry Battalion in our state, which is aligned with the 86th IBCT out of Vermont. Where's Vermont? Oh. Uh, and thus with the uh, 10th Mountain Division. Oh, there you go. 10th Mountain, climb to glory. Oh. Who is, sir? Um, but they are distributed, our battalion is distributed across the state of Colorado, and we have one of the companies in the western state, the western part of our state, and they are over 300 miles from Fort Carson. And we've been working really hard with um, Army National Guard G3 Training Division to get federal recognition for training area in the western part of the state. We're not looking for funding. We're just looking at, for the uh, federal recognition to provide the top cover to do federal training on that land so they don't have to travel six or eight hours sure. to training and then back from training. And, so, and uh, obviously it sounds like there's a problem and no one said yes. Are people saying no? Uh, people are saying no, yes, sir. Um, oh. So NGB, I think, sir, is about to... Uh, go visit again your G3 demo TR folks yeah. with three vignettes from across the Army Guard. Uh, ours is one, uh, and I won't name out the other states, they might not know, but um, we just like some real look at that because our active duty components, our counterparts, at the captain and the major level, they're allowed to authorize federal soldiers to train on private land, where in the National Guard, a tag can't do that. Okay, so it sounds screwed up to me, so let me dig into it. You don't know anything about it? You don't know jack about it, do you? Okay, so 
this is good. I mean, this is why we do these things, right? So it's amazing the stuff that when you're at a level like I'm at that you don't know. So I'm going to dig into it. And, uh, and you're the chief of staff out there in Colorado? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, sir, I meant to start off with this. I do appreciate last year I think you said you were going to take a look at mandatory training requirements. I did. And I, and I understand AR350-1 is coming back out with it, some adjustments, and I certainly appreciate that. That's true. In fact, this is no kidding. I actually have it on my desk at my house, and I'm reading it when I go home tonight. Isn't that exciting? That's what I do on a Saturday night. <laughs> not, I'm not kidding. That's what I do on a Saturday night. I read 350-1. It's awesome. <laughs> All right, okay, thank you, but sir. thank you. Thanks for that question, and we're going to dig into that. Okay. Next question. Sir, good afternoon. Captain Vince Thierry from the great state of New Jersey. Uh, I serve on the company grade committee here, sir, and uh, a big topic that has come up over the past couple of years in our discussions, both with General Grass, General Cadavy, and others, is the opportunity for broadening assignments and fellowships and other such programs for the Army National Guard, and I'm assuming on the air side they have something as well. Sure. I'm asking you, sir, that if uh, you could take this back with you, that we look further to broaden our experiences and our skill sets as company grade officers making that transition to strategic leaders, field grade officers, by including the Army National Guard in a larger proportion of the allocation for those programs, specifically the fellowship program, sir. Sure. Uh, I will do that. Now. That was easy, sir. It's Thank you. <laughs> Uh, let me make a comment on that, though. Um, but let me finish my note. Um, okay, so the broadening thing is is very important for all the components, uh, but because we do want officers at more senior levels to have a a very broad uh, underpinning of experience, education, etc. Uh, and there are a lot of opportunities in academia and industry, etc. Uh, but one thing is for graduate school. Uh, so graduate school, we have fully funded programs, uh, but also, uh, you know, the, the various forms of the GI Bill, which, depending on which one you're under, uh, they can help out too. What I've heard from uh, most of the captains I've talked to is the challenge isn't, you know, how you're going to pay for it, whether it's fully funded or, or through a GI Bill. Uh, and most captains, in fact, that I've talked to are willing to pay their own way to graduate school. It's a time thing, and it's also a time away from troops as it relates to your uh, possibility or potential for promotion. So what happens is a young captain has X amount of years as a captain, and they have to do certain types of jobs in order to establish an experiential base to be promoted to, say, major. And uh, if they spend time in a broadening assignment, it may take them away from troops. So what's the solution? So one thing I've got some folks looking at, um, it's sort of like a pause button. Uh, in order to get someone the time it takes to do these broadening assignments without damaging the necessary military assignments that they have to do for career uh, advancement, uh, maybe we should pause their career, uh, not their money, they stay in the military and all the rest of it, uh, but we don't, we like change their year group uh, so that they are competing then not against the group that they were in when, uh, when they left to do this broadening assignment, but they're competing now against a different year group. Uh, there's a couple of uh, little tricks of the trade we can do so that it doesn't damage the officer. The idea is to send someone off to be broadened so that we can take advantage of them at a senior rank. What happens all too often is we send someone off to be broadened, they miss key assignments, and they never get promoted to the senior rank. Uh, so it's, it, it's kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's a self-defeating uh, thing for us. So I'll look into that for the guard, uh, and I'll get with Tim and see how we can make the various broadening opportunities uh, more available to the, uh, for, to the guard officers. So we'll do that. Why, what uniform are you in there, Ranger? <laughs> Sir, I'm working here this weekend. <laughs> oh, okay. I just want to check. It. So, right, thank you, sir. You know, we're, is, that's not in a jersey uniform, right? Sir, you did not see my sweet tracksuit earlier. That was a jersey uniform, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Killing me. Killing me. But at least you had your sleeves rolled. Okay. <laughs> I 
Good afternoon, good afternoon, sir. My name is uh, Major Jared Sakelik from Pennsylvania. I just wanted to uh, express some concern with some of the software that the, and this is generally from the Army that we get overall. It seems to be that we get these software packages that are supposed to increase our productivity as well as communication and interoperability between everything down from unit level to AMCOM awareness of ORH, things like that. But the actual execution of it becomes very cumbersome and often results in more work having to be done by the user level. We spend hundreds of millions of dollars, it seems like, on these softwares from GSS Army that didn't include interoperability for TDA units, which is a National Guard. Uh, active duty doesn't have to really manage that kind of but it didn't help come with TDA unit capability out of the gate. Um, alls, dealing with logistics, and the numerous issues we've had with that at flight facilities. And it seems to be that it's become such a, 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 a normal thing that people stopped, soldiers stopped complaining about the software and just continually work through or around the problems until, until somebody gets together and, and creates like a, some and gets the people to actually speak up a little bit. Right. Um, I mean, there's a couple problems here. The, the whole IT piece of the Department of Defense, the U.S. government, the Department of Defense, and then the United States Army within the Department of Defense, and then the Army Guard is a subset of the Army. I can't adequately describe in words. <laughs> that are suitable for public consumption. Uh, how I feel about all of that. But, but, but I also say it's extremely complicated. Um, not insolvable, but complicated. Uh, commercial industry, at least my perception, of course the grass is always greener on the other side, but commercial industry seems to have a much easier time than we do when it comes to IT and software. Uh, there's an awful lot of effort, uh, not specifically on your problem, but an awful lot of effort uh, generated in the IT world. And yes, you're right, bazillions of dollars. Uh, Secretary of the Army Fanning has launched some initiatives uh, to review uh, the entire, you know, soup to nuts review of the entire uh, IT comms network sort of uh, uh, architecture, not only for combat, but for the peacetime stuff. Uh, let me uh, ask you, like I did previously, for a little homework assignment. <clears throat> Can you send me a note, specific email, specific, lay out the specifics, lay out the whole thing for me. You sound like you know a fair amount about it. Get together with uh, some of your buddies there, majors, captains, lieutenant colonels, uh, put together I don't know, two, three, four pages of some detail here, uh, and include in there, if you could, specific actions that you think would help, uh, that could be done to implement exactly what you're talking about. And then I'll take that, uh, and Tim and I will, will work it at the senior levels of the Army, and, and we'll try to get after it as best we can. Uh, but uh, what I need you to do, though, is help me out understand a little bit more of the full depth of the problem that you're, you're talking about, okay? Yes, sir. Great, thank, thank you. you, sir. I'm not done yet. <laughs> I would take my cap. I'm, I'm getting, you sit right back down there, Deb. Yes, sir. I'm, get, I'm getting a lot of good stuff from these guys. I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven taskers for Academy. <laughs> All right, I'm just kidding. She wants me to go, so. Hey, look it, let me just say thanks so much to all of you for what you do, for your patriotism, for your skill, for your talent, uh, and what you do every single day for our country and for the American people. You really are a great representative of the People's Army, so thank you. They love you. We do. General Milley, thank you so much for taking uh, some time with us and, and not only to speak to us, but to listen to us. We appreciate that. 
And you know, I don't think we're going to have this kind of a crowd at the end of the day on Monday for that other speaker that's coming in. This is pretty, they love you, they appreciate you, they want you. And I want to give you just a, a small token of our appreciation that uh, a book called What So Proudly We Hailed, it's the first biography written about Frank, Francis Scott Key in 75 years. I penned a little personal note in there so you can't sell it on eBay, it won't get you anything. Um, but as you know, um, the, the words that he penned became the lyrics of our national anthem over 200 years ago right here in this city. So please do take this token just to remind us, remind you that you had a great time here with us. Thank you. And that you got General Kadavi a lot of opportunity <laughs> to improve our, our Army National Guard. So thank okay. you so much. So should I, so what do you think? Should I read this tonight or 350-1? What do you think? I think you'll get a good night's sleep no matter which one you use, sir. <laughs> All right. Hey, thank you. God bless you all. With a sergeant at arms, please escort our distinguished guest and his party from the platform. Thank you, sir. Well, I don't have to wait till he leaves the room to say things about him. Was that fabulous or was that fabulous? That was worth waiting for. There's the picture. Well, it's been a great opening day, and our events of the day are not yet over. So please join us this evening in the exhibition floor for the governor's reception. I'd like to see everybody there visiting with our industry partners. Please realize this is an opportunity for you to see what the newest, latest, and greatest is, for to talk through issues that you have with equipment that we currently have, and truly to ha perhaps have some food and good drink while you're there. And I... Um, if you think we had prominent speakers today, don't think it's going to be, you're going to be slighted tomorrow. Now, the great day plan, we have our new chief of the National Guard Bureau who will address us tomorrow, and the new chief of staff of the Air Force will address us tomorrow. I understand we have no administrative announcements, so I will see you in your seats well before the 0800 start time tomorrow, right? Have a good evening. <laughs>